All right, looks like we are live. Welcome everybody to Standing for Truth. I am your host, Donnie, and tonight we have the great age of the earth debate. And I am here with two very knowledgeable individuals, two seasoned debaters, Luca Medugno and T-Rock. We are going to be debating the important topic, age of the earth, young or old. T-Rock, Luca, gentlemen, thank you so much for giving us your time for tonight's debate. And you gentlemen are on mute. Just make sure you unmute yourself. Okay. Tirak, you want to go first? No, I'll I'll just um, real quick before we get into any intros again. Thank you uh, so much, gentlemen, for doing this. To the audience, thank you so much for being here for tonight's debate on the age of the earth. If you're not yet subscribed, but you love debates, interviews, lectures, and more, please make sure to hit that subscribe button. Also, share around this content as the truth. And of course, critical thinking is so incredibly important. Now, what I want to do is go over a few kind of reminders for everybody. We got a lot of a lot of fun events for you scheduled for April, May, and June. So I'm going to go over a couple of those events that we have scheduled. Uh, we just took a few nights off in terms of debates, at least. We did a lot of behind the scenes work, and uh, I've scheduled a whole slew of of new debates we've got t-rocks going to be back here um first thing in may i believe it's may 2nd the genesis flood debate he'll be debating mark drysdale i'll i'll be debating taylor from the snake was right youtube channel this will uh be in a few days actually april april 19th at 9 p.m est so we are going to be debating do endogenous retroviruses provide evidence for evolution and of course the evolution debate challenge series continues uh first week of may a lot of people are excited for this one ian chen and dr dino the big showdown is there reasonable evidence for evolution uh kent will also be debating next week wade the wizard so they're gonna have their big round two debate on is there reasonable evidence for evolution uh also we just had our uh two-day event on flood boundaries so this was a flood boundaries conference, about five hours long. We had John McKay and Joe Hubbard here for that. So if you haven't yet seen that, please check that out. But we do have, as everybody knows, we want to give you a diversity of, of topics to enjoy. So we do have a two-day event uh, coming up in a couple of weeks, the 27th and 28th. We named it the Slaying Heresy two-day event. So uh, day one, we're going to have Kelly Powers here. We're going to be countering the Jehovah's Witnesses. So that's going to be a ton of fun. And then the very next day, we're going to have Christian apologist Anthony Rogers here. We are going to be uh, discussing the Trinity and, of course, uh, addressing objections and encounters to the Trinity. So that's going to be a two-day event, 27th and 28th. And uh, both of these gentlemen will be giving <clears throat> uh, technical presentations on the respective topics. And of course, we'll be doing live audience Q&A. As always, we like to keep these shows, these events, these conferences interactive with everybody in the chat. Okay, let's get right into the fun. Again, Luca, T-Rock, thanks so much for doing this. Let's kind of break the ice, get to know you you guys a little bit before uh, you know we, we get into some opening statements. So why don't we start with uh, Luca? Luca, how you been? What's going on? And thank you for doing this. Well, busy as usual, I will say. I, as most of you know, I work as a teacher, elementary school teacher, and I had some very busy weeks because we are going to um, the toward the uh, end of the year for our students. So a lot of work there, but I'm fine. I'm an atheist, as you know, and I just love to do these debates. Uh, it's the first time on the topic. I hope to do well. And first of all, to talk about interesting things. Uh, it's the most important thing to me. So I will leave the, the floor to Tirok. 
Thank you for that introduction. Luca, again, I appreciate you engaging this important topic. This isn't your first debate. You've been on this channel uh, many times before debating a good diversity of, of topics. So this one uh, specifically should be fun. T-Rock, uh, good to have you here again as well. You've been here several times. And how you been? Uh, what's going on? And a little bit about yourself there, T-Rock. Uh, things are good. I've uh, I've got a very busy lifestyle because I, uh, I basically manage two full-time jobs, but um, I always try to find time to stay studied up on on uh, origin debate topics, things like that. So um, let me thank you real quick, Donnie, for hosting us and for all the hard work you and your team put into this. Um, thank you, Luca, for joining the discussion. Um, and thank you for sending the uh, reading material. I didn't get a time to, to dig into it real deep, but I did read as much as I had time for, so it, I found it very interesting. Um, but yeah, I'm here to defend the biblical view of creation and uh, a young earth at approximately 6,000 years and uh, look forward to being able to strengthen the faith of those who believe and uh, give those who do not believe a real good reason to rethink their position. You're muted, Donnie. There we go. I appreciate it. Uh, thank you for the introduction, uh, T-Rock, and thanks to the both of you. I understand how busy you both are. So again, I really appreciate your time. Uh, as I know, this topic is one of everybody's favorites, age of the earth, old or young. So before we get into the opening statement, why don't we uh, kind of go over the format for tonight? Now, we are going to be uh, doing generally a, a formal debate. We're going to have roughly 12-minute opening statements. And then we're going to have eight minute uninterrupted rebuttals, followed by a roughly 30 to 40 minute discussion where the debaters are discussing the points brought up in the openings and rebuttals. And of course, we always keep these discussions uh, civil and as equally timed as possible. Then we'll have uh, five minute closing statements. And then this is where we get you guys in the audience involved. We're going to have an audience Q&A, roughly 25 to 30 minutes. So please make sure you're tagging me at Standing for Truth with your questions. And that way, I won't miss them. Okay, so since we both kind of have an affirmative tonight, uh, old or young, Luca holding the old earth position, T-Rock holding the young earth position. Is there any uh, preference in terms of who wants to go first? I personally don't care. Uh, flip a coin. It doesn't matter to me. How about you, Luca? Oh, I think you're on mute, Luca. For me, it's the same. Uh, okay. So, whatever. Okay, why don't you guys, uh, <laughs> usually we figure this out pre-show, but why don't you guys uh, pick a number? I'll, I'll, I'll pick a number between 1 and 10 in my head. Whoever gets the closest can um, choose if they want to go first or, or second. Five. So, five, okay. Three. Three. It was seven. So, Luca... Uh, you won that round. Uh, do you want T-Rock to go first or second? I'll go first. Okay. So we'll let uh, Luca let's, go first. Let's busy. Let's get busy. Let's get <laughs> rocking. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try my best. Okay. Cool. If you need to sh uh, share any slides, gentlemen, just let me know and I can uh, put mm -hmm. it up on screen for you. And what I'll do, uh, Luca, when you reach the 11 minute mark, I understand mm -hmm. you're probably timing yourself, but you know, once, once yes. you get into your presentation, I'll just say, you know, one minute warning kind of thing. I'll go from there. Fine with me. Okay. Uh, I think you can see my screen. I yes. Mine. Okay. Okay. Okay, age of the earth uh, debate, my position. Okay, let's go over dating methods, uh, a very simple overview. Here you can see all, uh, all, not all, not even close, but some dating methods, uh, relative dating and absolute dating. Relative dating, uh, it's something that give you a range and Absolute dating is something that gives you a date, uh, of course, with uh, 
division standard, but still a date. Uh, of course, here you can see in detail uh, some forms of radiometric dating, uh, quite popular between in these debates. Of course, are not uh, all of them. The, we have much more, but it's just to give you an idea how, on how many we have. Are they flawed? Uh, and my answer is yes. All those methods have some kind of problems. So, and I will not try to dispute uh, any problem with these methods, uh, not at all. But I will show you why we should trust them anyway. So, I will start with a simple example. And we start with a liter of water. Distilled water, actually. So, that's <laughs> that was made by me, that uh, drawing. Okay, uh, how can you tell that's uh, actually water, distilled water? I propose to wait, uh, measure the volume of the liquid and the measure the conductivity. Now, uh, if you do only one thing uh, at a time, you will not be able to know if you are with a um, liter of water or not, because you can have any kind of things under your backer. But with those results, so one kilogram for one liter of, uh, of material and this kind of conductivity, you will know that you have um, actually uh, distilled water. Why it's important? Because uh, tonight we will talk about dating methods and it's important to remember that they work when you uh, use them in conjunction with, with each other, not alone and not with only one interaction. Here you can see uh, various dating methods and you can see that you can uh, use a lot of them for the same uh, age range. And some uh, are quite different from radiocarbon dating. So it will be important because they are relatable. Why? Because when you use more than one method uh, and you get the same results, it will be very, very unlikely to have the same result with a different method unless you actually are measuring something right. And here you can see that. So let's start with uh, examples. I pick some very interesting one, I think. That's Otzi, it was discovered in Italy, uh, really near to Switzerland, uh, actually, but it was a very old man and it, it was, it's uh, more or less uh, 5,200 or 5,300 300, 300, uh, years old. Uh, what were the dating methods to measure his age? Uh, of course, we have carbon dating, uh, not only on his uh, body, but even with uh, his and X and analysis on his DNA was uh, very preserved. Uh, it's one of the most ancient uh, humans preserved in this kind of fashion. And it's very interesting. And also we did find a lot of information about his index and we 
uh, we scientists were able to uh, find out where uh, the metal was taken and it was in a cave in Tuscany, uh, a very old cave of course. Now another example and that's pretty famous if you ask me, uh, Gobeki Tepe. It's a very old uh, archaeological site, we think uh, that's um, a temple, a very old one. It's believed to be uh, very, very old. We are talking about uh, 11 or 10,000 years old. How do we know? Well, we did uh, measure the date with radiocarbon dating, of course, but also typology. Uh, it's a, a relative dating uh, measurement and also and that's very interesting the structure inside the temple was aligned to uh, the stars but not the current age stars but the stars of 10 12 thousand years ago so it was uh, aligned to stars that they are no longer in that position anymore so uh, i did um, give you some example of uh, analysis uh, done in uh, this uh, play in this place to show you how much uh, work was done here it's very important to understand how much work scientists put in this kind of things it's not like they measure a date and they call it a day they did it more and more time and you can see whole uh, times stamps here have a range. Anything in science is not perfect. We do know that uh, errors are a thing and they are taken into account. It's not like it's okay with our, our uh, hypothesis and so we uh, accept anything. Quite the opposite, if you ask me. <clears throat> Here you can see my uh, sources. Uh, I do advise to read them. Uh, there is a lot of uh, information uh, here, not only on Gobleki Table. So Jericho, my, I think, uh, favorite topic. It's a very interesting city, uh, very, very old. Uh, how much old we are talking still uh, even older than Gobleki Tepe uh, but the most important thing is that was uh, inhabited for more or less uh, 9,000 years uh, so we find uh, traces of uh, their inhabitants and they spent over a very long period of time how do we know? Well, stratigraphy and carbon dating. It was hard to find anything uh, about this site because uh, it was studied very, very, a very long time ago. So in the 50s, uh, it's hard to find the papers uh, about these things. But you can see some uh, modern analysis on the site. Uh, with, of course, uh, the uh, error range, uh, the division standard on that. Uh, it's a very interesting site. So uh, the age of the earth, uh, it's a very big topic. I cannot uh, speak enough about this, but it's possible to measure the age of our, our planet. I think so. Here you can see uh, you can see at least three methods to measure the date. And the interesting things it, are their um, half life. They are all different, one from the other. And you can see where you can put these methods in use. A very huge range of material and they are all different my question is 
how can something like that be consistent if uh, the methods are not working well? So uh, here uh, there, you can see something very personal to me. Uh, I, I've been in both of these places. Uh, Basilica Mayor, it's under the Milan Cathedral, where you can see that that's the Milan Cathedral. And Pompeii, I was being there, very beautiful place. Now, those are the Basilica Major and uh, corps of very poor habitants of Pompeii. Those are thousands of years old. Now, look at those. Uh, the, those are taken by my house. I, they are fossil. Uh, they belong to me. And they look quite different. They are thousands or millions of years, of years old. Here you can see the date uh, uh, for uh, secular uh, science. I will ask you to decide if they are almost as old as uh, the other two. We are talking about 4,000 uh, years old by the Young Earth model. For me, they are much, much older. I can stop my presentation. Thanks for watching. And here you can see my mail. Uh, Ask me anything, uh, you can write me uh, at this address. And I will stop there. Thank you, Luca, for that opening statement. That was 12 minutes. And again, to the audience, uh, I appreciate all the questions that are flying in. Uh, these chats Thank tend to get a little lively, so just make sure. Oh, oh, oh. And oh, we're good, Luca. We're good. No worries. Um, just make sure you're tagging me with your questions at Standing for Truth. And as always, we'll have a, a fun and engaging audience Q&A. Okay, now we're going to hand it over to T-Rock. T-Rock, you have uh, roughly 12 minutes as well for an opening statement. If you need to screen share, let me know, of course, and I can get those up on screen for you. I will be screen sharing. Looks good. Looks good. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, um, how is the age of the Earth determined? I'm um, going to take a look at some evolutionary clocks here. Um, and, and so I might start out by, by um, referring back to the title of the debate, is, um, Age of the Earth, is it young or old? Um, so Luca alluded to several um, sites, or, uh, archaeological type sites that allude to an, an earth older than the position I hold, which is 6,000 years. And um, that's fine. In and of itself, though, proving that the earth is older than 6,000 years does not by default prove that it is 4.55 billion years old. There's a vast difference there. So um, I'm going to talk about some of the, the dating methods that, that cross a broad time span. Um, so if you're a scientist and you reject the Bible as a historical account, and you don't know the age of the earth, and that is the the very thing that you're investigating. To be an honest scientist, you have to in you have to examine the full spectrum of possibilities, which means you're not strictly looking for things to be old. You're looking for signs of both age and youth. Um, that is, if you truly believe there are unbiased scientists out there. Um, I might ask real quick, Donnie, is my audio coming through okay? Oh, yeah, it's coming in great. Okay, good, thanks. Um, so, yeah, you have to look at the full spectrum. If you're going to consider yourself to be an honest scientist, look at everything. You look for signs of age, if that's what you believe exists, but also look for signs of youth. So how is the age of the Earth determined? Um, <clears throat> so on, on the right side there, you see a, a, a handful of the most common dating methods. I, I need to constrict it here a little bit so that we don't have to do too much explaining about the methodology behind any one of them, but radiometric dating, that is of course what supports a very old um, earth idea. 
uh, carbon dating spans everything from, I, I don't know, I'll say roughly 100 years ago in terms of practical usability to um, up to apparently about 57,000 years. Um, ice cores, they span a broader range than that. They can hypothetically go back to hundreds of thousands of years. VARVs, I think, is kind of the same. Oxygen isotopes have kind of a, a, a long time span like that, but uh, none of those three go into the billions, though. And then, of course, dendrochronology, which also does not go into the billions. It goes into the tens of thousands, um, low tens of thousands, I believe. So <clears throat> here's the question, though, on the left side. Which one is the fixed reference frame for analyzing or calibrating the others? Um, the, the problem here is, is that none of them make a fixed reference frame for anything, not a single one of them. And, and so Luca mentioned, he said that, um, you need to collaborate the, the different methods, which I would totally agree with. Um, the problem is, is that you can't directly collaborate some of these. You, you simply have to say, okay, we quote unquote, no carbon dating goes back to 57,000 years. We quote unquote know that dendrochronology goes back to 12, 15,000 years, whatever. Um, therefore they collaborate. But here's, here's, this is the classic example of the issue that I, I come across with this. Um, somebody challenged me on dendrochronology here not too long ago, and they actually gave me a link to a paper um, that was supposed to demonstrate some 12,000 year old tree, uh, uh, tree rings. And so I went and checked the paper out. And as it turns out, in the paper, they were actually trying to use carbon dating as a background reference, i.e. the reference frame that I'm alluding to here. Um, but in this particular paper, they had to admit that there was not actually enough material there to carbon date it with. And so they were basically using some sort of step method where you, you kind of find the overlap between depths and and numbers of rings and that sort of thing and and so it becomes an additive process in in dendrochronology um but the problem remains the same the dendrochronology all by itself is doesn't tell you very much and you don't have the carbon dating there to back it up and then the problem gets worse when you start looking at the actual calibration though now luca was good enough to share one of his um uh, some of his sources with me, and I did get to go through and read some of that. I, I might pull it up if it wasn't, uh, it's a little bit time taxing to do that, but we can do that during the discussion for sure. I've got it on one of my screens here. But anyway, in, in that paper, um, they actually mention uh, tree ring dating as a backup. Actually, what they say is, th is that um, the carbon dating calibration was extended several years ago by tree ring dating to a certain amount. And I think the paper lists 12,000 and then 12,000 years is what ca uh, carbon dating calibration was extended to. But the problem is, what did you calibrate the tree ring dating to? So there's a, there's a huge amount of circularity in there. Um, tree rings, um, as anybody who knows very much about plants would know, is that uh, they can grow multiple rings per year. And the method isn't quite as objective as they would like you to think it is because it is an additive where you have to pull samples from sometimes different locations and then just make an assumption about which one and how much they overlap, that kind of thing, before you can add them together. So, so you're, you're kind of stuck with no direct way of, uh, of analyzing or calibrating either one of them strictly independently. In other words, the calibration is kind of forced. Therefore, any convergence that you think you have was actually kind of forced and it was kind of based on circular reasoning. And so you come across the same problems with ice cores and barves and oxygen isotopes. They all they all have variable rates is, is part of the problem. They have variable rates and they can't be directly calibrated against any known standard. They have to just be compared to something else and kind of make a best guess as to how accurate somebody thinks they really are. Um, okay, so creationist clocks, they're a little bit different, even though there is a lot of overlap. Um, eyewitness accounts such as creation. Um, this is actually a scientist's best friend, particularly if you're a scientist that does things like medical research or uh, material development, that kind of thing. Um, because when you perform experiments, you like eyewitness accounts of how you set your experiment up, how it proceeded through the duration of the experiment and what the final end game was. You like eyewitness accounts, period. <clears throat> um, 
engineering, medicine, modern technology, they don't work without it. Um, okay, so on top of that, for creationists, we also have radiometric dating. It's not an enemy to a creation timeline at all, contrary to many of the ac accusations that people make that we have to throw out all of science. We absolutely do not. Um, carbon dating, definitely a friend of young Earth creation position. Ice cores, same, VARVs, it doesn't matter. Oxygen isotopes, dendro chronology, we're, we're not using different dating methods. It's how we use them that's different. And which one of these is the fixed reference frame for analyzing or calibrating the others? It's quite obvious, just what I described in a scientific setting when you're developing real-time uh, medicine, uh, materials, technology, that kind of thing. The calibrating standard is your eyewitness account. <clears throat> you can't calibrate anything in a lab to do any real um, modern technology building without eyewitness accounts. <clears throat> okay, so... Proxies for time. This is slightly different than measuring directly. So there are many, many proxies for time. And they are, even though they don't give absolute dates, um, what they do is provide a really good cross check. So when Luca talks about uh, using multiple methods together, this is exactly what you want to do. Um, so I've got here salinity of the oceans. Um, you can only, you know, there's a certain rate at which. Uh, the salinity increases in the oceans, which means you can only wind it back so far before you have zero salinity in the oceans and it's pure fresh water. Um, Earth's magnetic field decay, I think we've got a question come in already kind of centered around this one, which I'd be happy to address. Um, lunar recession, ancient soft tissue, population growth, uh, presence of C14, sedimentation rates, rock folding, erosion rates, fulgurites, biological reproduction, mutation rates, and there's a plethora of others. But every one of these, instead of being a way to directly measure time, what they do is give you a sense of how much time has passed. And um, most of these actually um, imply some sort of um, maximum time that could have passed. Um, in the history of, of the of the entire Earth. Um, so they become very useful for cross-checking your uh, assumptions behind some of the other dating methods that go way beyond what anybody could have possibly witnessed um, in history, i.e. deep time. Um, these don't attempt to measure age directly, but rather give a sense of how much time may have passed. Okay, so what we're talking about then here is the difference between interpolation versus extrapolation. So in engineering, uh, we learn very early on in the program um, how to interpolate data. So it's real common to get a textbook full of numbers in a table. And so thermodynamics is what comes to mind for me. You go into a thermodynamics class and you want to talk about the heat exchanges and, and reactions and stuff like that. What you do is you, you break out the tables that give you things like temperature and pressure and, and so on and so forth and joules of energy and whatever. Um, and then they'll give you a problem. And the idea is, is that you find positions in the table that are close to your, your given circumstance, but not quite that. And then you interpolate in between them and, um, and to, to get an answer. And it's a valid method because the point on either side of your condition is already understood and known and has already been observed. Now, the antithesis to that is extrapolation. In engineering, you can take those tables and you can extrapolate outside of the data set, but just by a tiny little margin. There's not much room for it. And the reason is, is because it will induce big errors in real technology. And you have to avoid that because you can't go building bridges that are going to collapse because you extrapolated how much weight the thing can hold and, and that sort of thing. So um, in, in extrapolation, you know one little bitty data point over here to one side, and I'm talking from the reference frame of deep time and the age of the earth, you know a tiny little fraction of the data and you're trying to look way, way, way back in time, way outside the data. And um, that is a recipe for disaster in engineering. <clears throat> so it kind of looks like this in terms of an actual timeline. In the biblical timeline, we start at year zero with an eyewitness account of creation and we look forward and there is basically, for the most part, uninterrupted observation of human history from then until now which means we are almost strictly interpolating. Um, whereas evolution deep time, just like the slide before, um, starts out at um, 
in the present day condition and has to look back outside of the data by such a huge margin that there is no practical way to trust this type of methodology in any type of science that produces real world technology. And with that, I will uh, yield my time. <clears throat> Okay, thank you, T-Rock, for your 12-minute opening statement. Uh, gentlemen, I appreciate the visuals, and I appreciate the opening statements. Very clear and concise. Uh, fantastic job to the both of you. So now we're moving into the rebuttal portion of the debate. We've got eight minutes on the clock. And Luca, whenever you are ready, uh, the floor is yours. And again, you've got eight minutes. Let me just make sure you're unmuted. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> we clicked it at the same time. Yes. So whenever you're ready. <laughs> yes, ahead. I'm ready. So, uh, yeah. And my first word, uh, let's begin. So, yes. Um, very good. Very good. So, uh, how can we get to a point of reference? With dendrochronology, is quite simple. We start with living uh, material so we can get a good idea of their age and then we go backwards with uh, an overlap with those trees uh, you can get to uh, that tree and when you do a little bit of the of dendrochronology you can actually tell fails ring from others or even if the um, tree was in good health or with a lot of uh, uh, water or things like that. You can actually um, see certain events from dendro dendrochronology. So uh, examining uh, different trees, dead trees, so you can go back time for quite some time. You can actually get to uh, the uh, 11,000 uh, to uh, and more years old that we got with dendrochronology. Uh, how can you um, use that to uh, assess other data like radiocarbon dating? Well, radiocarbon dating, uh, if you have a piece of wood, you can do the analysis. It's strange to do not have enough material for that. I cannot say why. Uh, I would love to read more about that. Um, like uh, for radiocarbon dating, you need to uh, fix, uh, to fit the data with the calibration curve. And how can you do that uh, with uh, actual samples of uh, actual sphere? You can find it uh, in glaciers. Um, no, uh, in Antarctica or uh, places like that uh, inside the ice cores. Uh, ice cores are very interesting. They go back way back millions of years. And what I can say uh, with dendrochronology or ice cores, if scientists are wrong about the, that, how can how much are they wrong? Because they need to be wrong uh, by a long shot to be to have uh, only six thousand years old uh, Earth. And also, uh, my point was on archaeological uh, archaeological data. Why? Because we can uh, assess data much better with archaeology. Uh, first of all, we do have writings that span out for 5,000 years or so, a little bit more, so even earlier than the allegedly uh, flood. So that's a good point to start. And then you can use writings, uh, dates uh, written by uh, those people, uh, just think about things like Nani's letter or things like that, very, very old uh, piece of literature. And you can start from there um, to build your chronology. Also, you can get to stratigraphy. 
you can study how much time you need to uh, form a certain strata and you can say okay it's not too precise it's not uh, an absolute uh, dating method but you will get a range and if that range is in accord to uh, radiocarbon dating or things like that you will have something on your end how it's possible to uh, have a to have two different methods, completely different methods, to get the same result uh, over the same error range. Of course, there is always a little bit of the devi deviation standard, but how can you get to the same result? That's my problem. Uh, so also these sites uh, look at Jericho, for example they were uh, inhabited for a very very long time we find the corpses uh, we find a lot of cities stacked uh, one on the other so it's very very old and we know it and when you just have four thousand years of history and we do know a lot about the last 3,000 and a little bit more. Where did you squeeze anything else? Because what I've shown uh, tonight, it's only a small part of our history. We have much uh, older stuff, even if we, uh, we if even if scientists are wrong about this we do have much more to squeeze in this small window of time it's strange to say thousands of years as a small window of time but as you can see uh, where i live uh, thousands of years are almost like yesterday i've i've been in uh, uh, buildings that old 2000 or more years old and when i see um, fossils and things like that are completely alien i've been in pompeii that place was buried uh, 2000 years ago and that's it's almost like a city destroyed yesterday. It's incredible when you are there. So those are my points and my question. I yelled. Okay, Luca, thank you so much for that eight minute rebuttal. And there's about a minute that we can toss into the audience Q and A as we've already got uh, tons of fantastic questions flying in. So T-Rock, we are now going to hand it over to you and you have eight minutes as well for a rebuttal whenever you're ready. Thank you. Okay, so um, I think Luca asked the $100,000 question, how much can they be wrong? If they're wrong about all these um, supposed ages, how much can they be wrong? Well, the answer is actually fairly straightforward. And, and so again, I've said before, I come from kind of a manufacturing and engineering background. So um, kind of what, what you learn to do in that environment is actually apply the sciences and they're not altogether different sciences. Uh, a lot of times they're, they're pretty much the same things, the chemistry, the physics, um, you know, uh, the things that operate in the real world. So how much can they be wrong? So when, whenever you're the, the thermodynamics example that I gave a little while ago, this was actual problems that came up. Um, and, and so part of what they're doing, whenever you're taking a class like that and you get a, a question in front of you with certain parameters that you use to try and solve the problem, you go back and you refer to a table and then you find out, oh, my situation is outside the table. I have to extrapolate, right? Well, okay, there are two possibilities actually. If the value that, or the scenario that you're given is very close to the outer bounds of the table, you might be able to extrapolate and get a correct answer, but you might not. It's a real iffy 
place to be as soon as you step outside the data set. And, and, and again, it might work, but, but it's contingent on how close to the boundaries of the known data points are. And so the point is, is that when you, your, your, your given conditions are very far away from the outer bounds, you can't extrapolate. You already know in advance what the problem is trying to do is get you to seek a different method. One where you don't have to extrapolate outside the data set. That's what the whole point of those engineering exercises are. So what you learn too from that to answer this question directly, how much can they be wrong? They can be really, really wrong, really quick because when you get a little outside of the data set, you might get an answer that's kind of close and your instructor might accept it if it's, you know, within say, I don't know, 5% or so of, of what his expected answer is. He might accept it if he sees your methodology and says, okay, you used a more or less coherent means of getting there. You didn't quite get what I got, but okay, I'll accept it and you'll get full credit for it. Um, but um, if your answer is very far off of that, you're just wrong even though your methodology was technically correct. Um, because it, it, when you're doing engineering like this, one of the things you have to do simultaneously while taking these practical application courses is you also have to take the practical math and uh, learn a whole bunch of um, methods from what, how they like to say, the, the old dead guys that invented these methods, you have to learn all of their methodology and how to do those extrapolations, how to solve, you know, different systems and all that kind of stuff. But the point is, is that once you start extrapolating, the answers get really wrong really quick. And so, um, Luca, that is the answer to your question. As soon as you're extrapolating, you're inducing large amounts of error. And, and we're going to see that here in a little bit when, during the open discussion. Hopefully I'll, I'll have a little bit more time to elucidate on that. Um, one of the things I, I probably wanted to talk about along those lines is, um, well, it ha has more to do with calibration, I guess. They, um, Luca shared the paper with the, um, uh, what's his name? Oxy, is that his name? The, the guy found in the, in the mountains. Um, the whole thing yes. was centered around carbon dating and, and dendrochronology kind of stuff. And um, the methodology, basically what they're doing is they're, they're calibrating one against the other and trying to see if they can come, come up with some kind of correlation there. So um, the problem, of course, is that um, in one paper that you read, they show the methodology and it looks sound scientifically. But if you go find a completely different paper that uses the same methods, they're actually doing the opposite. And instead of using carbon dating to calibrate tree ring dating, they're using tree ring dating to calibrate carbon dating. So it's this whole calibration curve and how you know whether you're inside the known data points or not. And, and the only way you can do that philosophically, you have to ask yourself, how can you know how old something is if you don't, or let me say it a different way. How can you know if your method is accurate if you don't already know how old the thing you, you're trying to date is? And so that's that's a basic philosophical um, underpinning of all dating methods. You, and, and so Luca uh, kind of alluded to this earlier um, when he brought up the effective dating ranges uh, and, he, and he had a, a chart up there that showed uranium lead, uh, 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 potassium argon and rubidium strontium. And uh, it had a, a column in there that said effective dating ranges and it gave ranges in which those methods are expected to produce viable results or, or accurate results as it were. Um, but the question is, how do you know? How do you know what an accurate result is if you don't already know what the age is? <clears throat> and so anyway, back to the uh, tree ring and carbon dating. Um, one of the things that came out in that in that paper um, had to do with the uh, use of accelerated or accelerator mass spectrometry. And it made a really interesting uh, point there. I've got about two minutes left here. So I don't think I'm going to go ahead and try and bring this up because I thought it was really, really interesting. It's a common, common objection for. Um, let me see if I can find this. This is this is the link that um, and I've read through to the bottom of this. So I'm not necessarily at the place where um, let me see if I can find it this way. It really it really is worth finding. Um, 
There you go. <clears throat> Measurements with accelerator mass spectrometry. Um, so basically, I've got it here on screen. Anybody can kind of freeze this and screen capture it for later or whatever. But, but basically, what they're going to say in here is that um, the sensitivity with the advent of the accelerator method, there, there was a, a previous method that was used where they were literally waiting one hour at a time for a... Um, for a, uh, a decay event to occur to measure it. And so it would take several days to go through a, uh, a dating procedure for a single sample. And the samples had to be quite large. So with the advent of the accelerator mass spectrometry, what they did was literally speed up the process um, by orders of magnitude by counting individual atoms in the sample itself, and you could use a much smaller sample and all that kind of thing. But, but one of the big points that they bring out here is that um, they basically got the sensitivity down so low that they didn't have to worry about background noise anymore. And that's big because one of the main objections to uh, C14 in things like dinosaur bones is that um, it's, all this background noise obscures the results and blah, blah, blah. But according to this very paper that, that Luca shared with me, background noise is not the problem with an AMS method. So with that, I believe I will stop because I'm right at my eight minutes. Yes, just on time. That is eight minutes. Time is flying by. Gentlemen, that concludes the opening statements and the rebuttals. Now we're moving into the open discussion. And this open discussion will be roughly 30 minutes. We'll kind of see how it goes. And uh, during this time, I'll be saving questions from the audience. And why don't we start with uh, Luca? Since T-Rock just ended with his eight-minute rebuttal, uh, Luca, why don't we give you the floor for the first point yes. or uh, first question? Go ahead, gentlemen. Yes, uh, I would love to discuss uh, OTSI because I love the subject. First of all, uh, the most important thing uh, there was uh, radio radiocarbon dating. So uh, they did uh, examine his uh, body and also his axe uh, was bought uh, with carbon dating. Uh, how we can tell that carbon dating is accurate or not? Well. It was a very interesting story with Odyssey because when it was discovered, people uh, believed uh, it was um, a much rich, recent um, uh, person. So they believe it was someone uh, from the last century or so. And what happened when you do an analysis like that and you are completely off? Well, you will get uh, a completely off the chart results. Um, so uh, we can tell when we are off by some order of magnitude, of course. But the most important thing is um, with the analysis with the axe, they analyzed the wood and they came up with a consistent result, but they also examined uh, the copper. And they uh, got to uh, a cave, and uh, not a cave, um, a place where uh, people were extracting that metal in that age. And that's quite something. Also, uh, we are talking about copper age. Uh, copper age, it's a problem by itself because if you look at the Bible, you start basically in the Bronze Age. That's copper age. And <laughs> before that, you have Neolithic, Paleolithic, and we do have findings about all those periods. Please. Oh, T-Rock, you're on mute. Uh, yeah. Okay, so Donnie, if you can share the screen again for me one more time. I tried to highlight here. Maybe it'll come up good and blue for everybody. So talking about um, this is the paper that, um, mm -hmm. that Luca shared. So talking about how you date something and how you know it's going to be right, wrong, or indifferent, whatever. Um, 
here's what I was talking about a while ago. However, only with the use of an accelerator is it possible to reduce the background to a level where the minimum C14, C12 ratios in the range of 10 to the minus 12, 10 to the minus 15 can actually be measured. So basically what they're saying is background issue is, or background uh, uh, noise, as it were, is not an issue anymore with the accelerator method. Um, otherwise, uh, and, and so when they're talking about the range, the, the ratios being in the range of 10 to the minus 12, 10 to the minus 15, what they're referring to is the effective use. And let me see if I can find this for you real quick. Um, uh, it's not coming up through the, through the basic find. It's okay. Um, it's it's a, basically what they do is they go on in here and say that it's it should be good up to about 57,000 years. And so th this brings me back to the whole calibration thing, um, Luca. Mm -hmm. The uh, spectroscopy thing, it's just a more accurate method to do radiocarbon dating. Sure. Of course, the more you uh, accurate you are measuring the rate of um, the presence of radiocarbon in the sample, better you can uh, do your measure. Uh, so you will be more precise, but it's, uh, well, okay, they use a very good method, uh, more precise, that's good. Uh, so more precise uh, basically means they can measure the atoms more precisely. Yes, we're not, we're not measuring uh, if you use that kind of method, you will get a better result. With other methods, you will have more difficulty to... Uh, know how much radiocarbon it's in the sample sure. uh, if you have a very old sample it's of course more difficult and the background noise is when you do an analysis you will get um, those um, that background noise uh, sure. so, no, uh, let me address that real quick. so you will always have some background, background now noise. Uh, lower is the noise, uh, better the results. If okay. you have a noise uh, that's one third of your result, you have a, a very big problem. If the uh, noise is as tall <laughs> as your result, you will have no result at all, of course. Okay, so this is where they give the limit on the supposed age, that 10 to the minus 12 to 10 to the minus 15 range equates to this, what you see on screen here, 57,000 years is roughly what they're saying the, the detection limit is. But um, so somebody asked a question in, in the last time I did an age of the earth debate, they asked the question about um, carbon dating used on Pompeii, which you had in one of your slides. And so mm -hmm. what the, the, their point was, they, they were a person that kind of believes in a in an in-between, between a 6,000 year and a four and a half billion years, I remember it anyway. Mm -hmm. The point they were trying to make was that in Pompeii, you can measure the samples and get to within one year of the actual age of the samples. And you so get what they were the saying point then point. is by extension, the method is so good, it gets us to with one year. That means if you go carbon date something at say 50,000 years, which is inside considerably, it's 90% inside the limit here, of uh, or uh, it's within the last 10 percent of it whatever but 50,000 years i mean scale it back 30,000 years you're well outside the biblical time frame but the point they were making is is, is if you can carbon date something to within a year that means that your 30,000 year or your 50,000 year uh, age assignment must also be valid but that is absolutely not true because the whole calibration and this is one of the points i want to bring out for you specifically since you're into biology um it's it's C14. So C14, of course, is only done on biological um, matter, right? Typically, <clears throat> barring diamonds. But nonetheless, the point is, is that um, in the biblical time frame, there is a flood. The flood basically wipes all the vegetation off the earth. And, um, and, and I have to take that a little bit loosely because it, it does basically do a scrub of the earth's surface. Um, nevertheless, there's still probably plant matter floating 
on the, on the water, that kind of thing. It doesn't matter. Um, but you basically kill a whole bunch of plant life. And then afterwards you have a, uh, kind of a warm, wet period, probably for a hundred years or so. And, uh, and then you go into an ice age that lasts somewhere in, in, uh, mainstream young earth creation thinking about five to 700 years. And then after that, you have places like Egypt being, um, civilized right so one thing we know about egypt from the bible and from um, mainstream archaeology is that they went through some serious uh droughts and desertification even so i guess my point to you is is that when you look at calibrating the curve of a carbon 14 range and and, and it's it's dating ability i I would think as a biologist, you have to recognize that when you have extreme events like a flood scrubbing the, the vegetation off the earth or desertification that takes large land masses and basically lays them waste with sand and no vegetation, you are seriously disrupting the carbon, the carbon balance. And therefore, your calibration curve has to include that in order to be accurate. Would you agree? Well, uh it's possible, of course, to uh, have problems with dating if uh, something like the flood is true. But uh, with all those examples, where I made those examples, why? Because we uh, are talking uh, to people uh, with certain ideas, and it's important to recognize their points, their point of view. All the example given tonight, uh, minus the last one with the age of the earth, are after the flood, because those cities, all of them are outside the flood uh, boundary. So all those examples are clean of the flood. So we'll see. it's after the flood. It's impossible to have I'll see uh, mm, it's after the flood for sure because we found the when you say after do you mean older than the flood date no, no uh, it's older than the date of the flood but in your model is uh, younger for right. sure right. because you find the body in a glacier you cannot have a, that kind of Thing, uh, during a flood during a flood you have in your model right uh, the that, entire, would make it, uh, that would make it ice age um, yes which it would put the dating uh, deep below not in a glacier uh, so it's after the, the flood so um, with otzi we do not have that problem and the problem uh, is actually actually you do because the ice age uh, like i said uh, typically is um, believed to be around five to 700 years in duration, starting about 100 years after the flood, which is about 4,400 years ago. So if you add about or subtract about 800 years, um, post ice age would begin roughly at um, 3,600 years ago. Now, here's here's the problem and why what you said is just not true, because there is also desertification event and you also have a recovery period after the flood and after the ice age both because the ice age actually has a similar effect to desertification and that is that when you look at europe and and so uh, by mainstream reckoning the ice age was a period when up to about 30 percent 33 percent roughly a third of the planet was uh, regularly experiencing large swaths of ice and glaciers and snow and that kind of thing and so it has the same basic effect on carbon dating in that when you bury all your trees and your grass and your plants under the snow, they're no longer absorbing carbon out of the air and they're no longer cleaning it up. You know what I'm saying? So again, you've completely disrupted the carbon balance. And so your calibration curve that you would like to believe is, is good past that point. It's not, it can't be. But, uh, aside for, we can uh, analyze the atmosphere uh, inside the micro bubbles in the glacier so we can get but then what do you the, how do you know uh, how do you know how old the bubbles are in the glacier in the in the because ice? if it's that bubble it's uh, near the body you can tell that the atmosphere is 
the same. Okay. So it has a, so a you can relative. calibrate the curve if you want. Okay. So you can get to pretty good results. Uh, but other than that, uh OTSI was not dated only with the carbon dating. Right. They get to a cave uh used by people during that age. So more analysis, more confirmation on that in Tuscany. They get to the cave and also still um uh, that man was from the copper age. The copper age for your model is a problem by itself because we start with the bubble with the bronze age. That's copper age. It's below. And then you have Neolithic age, even for the battle with different technology and so on and so forth. We do have in Italy sites from Neolithic, then copper age like Otzi. Otzi, it's special because it was very well preserved. Also, we do have is DNA, so molecular clock. We do know is um, a place between uh, our, um, how can you say, um, where it was uh, during more or less the uh, limit range of his age um, from his dna we can tell uh, where he was uh, we do know more or less uh, the migration pattern of humans between with uh, genetics so we can get an idea even from that okay and so you don't have only otzi you have a plethora of findings about these ages and they are older than bronze age so you're you're kind of highlighting my point for me because the paper that you shared with me quite openly acknowledges the need for an improved calibration curve and so they're they're trying to calibrate c14 they're trying to calibrate um the tree ring dating and, and so they, they actually reference in here int cal 98 and so the 98 represents, I guess, the year that, that the, um, the proposal in the open literature for that particular methodology for calibration was published. So that, you know, that's uh, at this point, that's 24 years old. There is now an IntCal 20 that's kind of, uh, and, and there's been several iterations in between there. IntCal 13, I think, was the one that preceded uh, 20. 20 is basically, I don't know if it's actually in use or, and it's almost certainly probably not in widespread use yet, but the paper that was shared with me was um, um, basically that's, and this is one of the real important points. It was a, a paper that was published in the open literature, but it was basically making a proposal. And when you make a proposal on a calibration method like that, um, it has to withstand the test of time. And so in Cal 20, there's not been enough time passed, enough widespread usage to even know anything about it yet. Um, nevertheless, it kind of brings me back to the, the whole point of calibration. You're mentioning all these other methods, the copper, you know, the analysis that was uh, talked about in this paper and whatnot. Those methods have to be calibrated too. What are they calibrated against? Quite honestly, they're calibrated against somebody's ideology of how much time should have passed. Because ultimately, just about any dating method you can contrive, you can go out there and get plenty of wrong answers for. And then how do you know they're wrong? Well, in, in more modern times, you might be able to chain together some kind of uh, sounding seemingly uh, sensible argument for it. But further back in time you go, you kind of lose all of that real quick. And so what I wanted to do, you mentioned convergence in dating methods. So <clears throat> what I want to do is um, show you, let me, let, let's look at this idea right here. Donna, can you share my screen real quick? Okay. Yeah. So this is one of my former slides that I've, I've used before. Um, make sure I can hit the right button here. Okay. So, the point is you, you want convergence on your dating methods. And I'm saying, I'm saying they don't converge the way you think they do. And uh, one of the, one of the main objections against a young earth is the uh, limestone deposits in, in the U S and, and abroad. 
And so uh, it was stated in the last Age of the Earth debate that I did that, you know, millimeters per thousand years is how they measure the deposition rate. But let's let's try that with some convergence here. Um, the whole idea, because these are inland uh, limestone deposits, um, the mainstream storyline is that the Earth was under a shallow sea, a calm and placid sea, as it were, is the way they described in the textbooks. And that's how we get these limestone deposits. But let's try that and compare it to lunar recession. Um, one of the points here is this little area, I don't know if it inversely related to R to the sixth power. And, and what that means is, is that as you wind the clock back, it's an exponential um, uh, movement of the moon in relation to the earth. So what happens is, look at this other block over here that says gravity is inversely proportional to R squared. So what's the problem there? The problem there is, is that you only have to go back about 100,000 um, years before you have major problems with gravity. And I want to show you this on my calculator real quick. I'll show you kind of what that means. That means that if the Earth is 10% closer, that means you divide 1 by 0 0.9, which is the 90% of the um, current distance, uh, that you're, you're examining and one over that, that means your gravitational attraction between the earth and the moon has increased by 23%. That's huge. So where's the calm and placid sea that supposedly existed a hundred million years ago in the U S how is it calm and placid when you've got a moon passing it once a month and dragging huge tides across the entire earth? Okay. I have uh, one question about that. Uh, when you do the math, you are uh, expecting a linear uh, closing of the moon. No, it's or? no. That's what I'm saying. It's not linear. It's it's this number right here, r to the sixth. That means yes. it's a very. It gets very rapid, very quick. Yes, because when you got close, of course, the force will be uh, stronger, but the movement of the moon it's in the opposite opposite direction it's going away so no it, as you uh, want the clock back the moon is getting closer to yes, the earth of course because uh, the moon was closer then of course but when the moon is closer the force is uh, bigger so it will be uh, slower uh, it will be uh, the movement will be slower. That uh, uh, no. factor is taking. No, that's the other. That's the other problem with lunar recession to retain to retain the conservation of angular momentum as the moon gets closer. It also has to speed up. Yes. So sure. your lunar cycle actually gets shorter and shorter the closer the 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 moon is to yeah. the Earth. And it gets longer and longer as as time progresses forward. Normally, your lunar cycle technically gets shorter and shorter. It's a small amount over over you know human lifespan. But you guys aren't talking human lifespan. You're talking hundred million you know mm -hmm. billions of years. So my my whole point here is uh, I mentioned earlier about limiting factors of of age. This is absolutely one of them, and probably the most difficult to reconcile of all the methods in in the problems that you induce with them because just a hundred million years ago you've got way too big of uh gravitational problems tidal problems earthquakes are also induced um, by strong gravitational pull external gravitational pull you've got all kinds of problems just a hundred million years ago let alone three billion years ago the in this model i don't know if you're aware of this or not but by this is standard newtonian physics in this model the moon crashes into the earth in about a billion years into the past so three billion years four and a half billion years absolutely not a hundred million years ago is your age of the dinosaurs how were the dinosaurs living at their peak um in the u.s with shallow seaways and a moon that was pulling huge tides across the oceans but uh what's not checking for me it's uh that for me the moon was never that close it was just going 
uh, away much slower. By what That's physics? Problem with it. By what because physics? When the moon is closer, you will get to a point where it will be no longer going away, but it will be uh, attracted to the Earth and it will collapse on itself. Of You're course. describing what's called the Roche limit, but the Roche limit is actually much closer than 90% of the current distance. And 90% of the yeah. current, and that's the point, 90% of the current distance is way too close already. You're yes. not even anywhere near the Roche what limit. I'm telling you, uh, it's that for me, uh, and I'm no uh, expert on the topic, uh, you will need something more expert than me. That the, the, um, the moon was just getting away much slower in the past. So now it's getting uh, away from the Earth at a much uh, faster rate. <laughs> Back then, not so much. I mean, I understand the sentiment you're trying to never, convey, but the exact direction. opposite is true. The exact hmm? opposite is true. When the I understand the sentiment you're trying to convey. You're saying that in the past, it moved away faster. Now it moves away slower. But actually, the opposite is true. No, no, no. no. Uh, the opposite. It was moving away slower in the past, and now it's... Right, right. Sorry, right. In the past, you're saying in the distant past, it was moving away from us at a slower rate than it is today. And today it's moving faster, right? But yes. this physics equation where you use the sixth power of the radius says the exact opposite. When it's closer, two things are happening. One, it's, it's making its um, revolution around the Earth much faster to conserve angular momentum. And the other thing is, it is moving away from the Earth faster than. The further it gets away from us, the slower it, rece it recedes from us. If one is closer, it's moving faster. So it, it was moving uh, faster away from us. So you will have an equilibrium sooner or later or not. And you can also do you can also do the velocity calculations uh, based on on uh, momentum. So whatever the current momentum of the moon is, you can wind the clock back using this R six idea in in physics. Pick a distance that you think the Earth should have been at in in some you know hundred million years ago, two hundred million years ago, whatever, and then you can use the conservation of angular momentum and you can calculate what the um, the lunar cycle was, how many days it's it's affected by that and what you come up with is bizarre different numbers that imply that um erosion rates that's another proxy for for calculating time erosion rates uh, creationists say all the time that erosion happens way too fast for millions of years but this very problem right here induces massive erosion rates even above today's standards and today's standards are too fast so the, the problem compounds when you start the more different proxies and dating methods you start incorporating, the more problems you induce. I want to be honest, I do not know enough on this topic to discuss. Uh, so, okay, fair enough. Let's, let's switch a little bit. Let's talk about if you want to um, carbon for, or uh, not carbon 14, mm -hmm. um, DNA in ancient tissues. Yes. I read. Uh, so I shared this paper with you, I believe, and I, uh, I'm not sure if this is the exact one that I, um, oh, they were talking about ages and ales and that kind of thing. But um, I, I don't think it's this one, Johnny, you don't have to keep sharing this. You can discontinue it. I mean, there's good information here, but what I was really going to talk about was that other paper. And um, yes, one of the, that's one, the one with dinosaurs. Yeah. Uh, that too. Did you get to read that whole thing? Yes. Okay, so what did you I'm think of it? Reader. <laughs> Hi, I'm a fast reader. Um, what did you think? I of read it? Uh, really fast when I need to. So, what did you think of it, though? It was interesting. Uh, I did not know about this uh, subject, so it was interesting to learn about. 
I also read uh, something more secular to be a little bit more informed on the topic. So it's interesting, but uh, what I think about it is it's very strange to find soft tissues on dinosaurs' bones, of course, but it's not really soft. Uh, we uh, both know that they are uh, mineralized uh, tissues to be soft, you need to bait them in. Acid. Well, hold on a second. That's that, hold on just a second. That's kind of an interesting statement because I've I've heard this talked about a lot of different ways. From mm -hmm. uh, and so when we say soft tissue, we absolutely do mean soft tissue because in the um, in the videos you can go on and see uh, Mary Schweitzer's interview and and not just hers but others where they literally take tweezers and stretch these things like a rubber band and watch them snap into place. So I when you say that when you say not soft tissue let's let's clarify what's actually being seen they are calcified exteriorly like they have a shell on them and you remove the shell and the shell itself is not the soft tissue it's the uh, semi permineralization sort of anyway once you get that out you absolutely are left with pure soft tissue underneath so it's more like a shellacking over the top and so a lot of a lot of um, evolutionists and old old earthers want to say there it's not soft tissue it absolutely is because you can stretch it with a pair of tweezers yes uh, once you treat that yes so maybe the, uh, the point yes it's a very interesting thing uh, and it's it was not expected uh, to find those kind of tissues so one of the one of the points behind bringing that paper up though um was that they were they were basically giving a critique of a mainstream science article right and um the the people in the mainstream article they were struggling with this idea of uh thermal degradation of biomaterials right mm -hmm. so in other words how, how what effect does temperature have on the degradation of biomolecules and the yes. numbers that are given in the standard literature pre Mary Schweitzer were really, really short compared to a 65 million year timeline. I mean, we some of them you could arguably stretch out to 6.8 thousand years. Now here's where calibration again comes into play. Some of those studies are actually calibrated against carbon 14 dating, but again, you're calibrating your, your cal your digital calipers with a rubber band it's it's kind of a, a bad methodology to do that but um one of the things that i got out of the article i don't know if you kind of picked up on this or not was that every time the mainstream journal references that temperature and bio decay curve they're always treating it like an average temperature for the entire year so they'll say typically they'll investigate like 10 C down to minus five C or something like that. And I think that's what was mentioned in this paper. Um, but in any given case, if you looked at the formula that they gave in that paper, temperature was a constant. Mm -hmm. And, and um, th the problem there is that in the real world, temperature is not constant. And so if you have a scientific inclination at all, you know that um, here, here's a, a great example I like to give. I'll try and be quick with this so you can give your opinion. But um, let's say I go and buy a six foot bar of aluminum rod and I buy a six foot bar of steel rod from a local supplier. And this is supposed to be precision material plus or minus five thousandths of an inch in length. I get it in and I measure the aluminum rod and it's a full quarter inch shorter than the steel rod. And so my first thought is, hey, these guys didn't sell me precision material. They did something wrong. So you call the manufacturer back up and I have my tape measure calibrated at the same calibration place that the supplier does. So my tape measure is calibrated to be accurate within say, you know, 128th of an inch or something like that. So I know when I see a quarter of an inch off, it's, it really is off. So I send it back and they measure it and they say, no, these are the exact same length. My, my measuring equipment is calibrated by the same company that does yours. And I'm measuring them both at the exact same length. What's the problem? Well, in engineering, 
all engineers and machinists know the problem. The problem is temperature. If I got mine in and I measure it on a cold dock where it's 20 below zero and somebody brought it in, dropped it off, and I waited a couple hours, went out there and measured it out in the, out in the freezing cold, aluminum has a much larger uh, thermal expansion curve than, than carbon steel does. And so the temperature is all wrong. When I sent it back to them, they measured it under standard temperature and pressure, which means it was probably around 68 C or 68 degrees Fahrenheit or so, at which point the aluminum expanded back out. So what's the point there? The point is that biomolecules have the exact same problem. They expand and contract with temperature variation. And that expansion and contraction absolutely destroys them faster than, than a constant temperature would, even if the constant temperature is higher. <clears throat> So the presence of those biomolecules, it really is a huge problem. They're not, they're not even using a variable temperature that represents real world scenarios when they advertise, oh, it can last 6.8 million years under ideal circumstances. Yeah, that's ideal circumstances, but where are, the bio, where are these soft tissues actually found? They're found in Hell Creek, Montana and, and places like that where they go undergo huge temperature swings. So go, go ahead, give your thoughts. Yes, uh, that's, first of all, I, based on my presentation on very recent, relative recent events, because I enjoy to have much uh, evidence as possible, but on dinosaurs' uh, soft tissues, it's true that it was not expected to find those kind of tissues uh, in dinosaurs, but scientists are trying to get an explanation and they have some hypotheses. The Felton reaction is one of them and uh, the biofilm, it's new for me. And I have read on your article and some uh, secular papers. And that's a very interesting thing for me because when I look uh, to a fossil and I look to bones that are thousand upon thousand of years old i see something very very different that tissue those tissues are very very small pieces of tissues inside a very well preserved fossil they are a very rare uh, occurrence they are quite unique not unique because we do well some of them i but. i don't think they're as rare as what you're alluding to though because uh, kind of what happened was um they were those soft tissue episodes were discovered well before mary schweitzer came along um after she came along mass media was growing rapidly and so word was getting out quick and uh, part of the problem was that uh, people weren't looking for them because as you've already said it was not expected it was a surprise but now that people are looking for them they are becoming increasingly more and more common they're getting very common now as a matter of fact i'm willing to bet you could go to just about any dig site in the world and if you spend enough time you can come up with samples that have soft tissue in them and you can definitely also I... come up do not know i do not think that they are so common but i'm not a paleontologist but i mean don't, don't I you think no and what i can tell they are quite rare instance don't but, you think that if you don't expect them and don't look for them you're not going to find them and if you know they're there you will look for them it's possible but now we know about them for quite some time so we should have uh, quite a good idea on much they are rare and for what i can say uh, for what i can see and i did some reading on that they are not common at all um okay let's let's take a look at that real quick because as it as it turns out here's here's what i actually did donnie can you share my screen mm -hmm. definitely yeah let me get it up on screen right now so luca what i did um uh, a couple weeks ago actually was i contacted the folks at, at uh, cmi looking for a specific interview with uh, mary schweitzer and i was also looking for some information on the uh, decay rates of, of bio material and one of the things that uh 
Joey Tay. I don't know if you're familiar with him from CMI. He sent me some information. And this is one of the pieces he sent me. Notice the title of this list of biomaterial yeah. fossil papers. Okay. Look, look at this long list and, and you're not even seeing the whole thing, but um, the point is the papers alone are quite common. It's a long list of papers that are published out there. So it, it is definitely more common than what you're alluding to. Yes, well, but we need, do need a list of the samples, not the papers. You need what? A list of the samples, not the papers, because if you got a sample uh, and you can even write a paper on um, the theory uh, behind that. So we need a list of the samples, not of the papers. Yeah, no, that's that's a fair point. Uh, point taken, you can write 10 different papers on one sample, right? Uh, um, I guess my point theory, here is, yeah. is that it, it has become quite common and, and created quite the stir. And, and so um, because it's created the stir, people are going to be looking for it more. And, and because they are looking for it more, they're looking for more explanations as well, like you said, um, still looking for what it is that preserves these things. Um, and, and so uh, when, we, when we hear the testimony of people like Mark Armitage, who is very big into this very subject, um, he being a real live field researcher, he says the opposite of what you're saying. He's out there in the field and taking people out on excursions and digging up stuff. And, um, and he even, he even let me, uh, kind of put the, the exclamation point on this when he takes students who are in training out to these sites and they find soft tissue, he has a means for them to contact him back with, with, um, their fines now they can't necessarily get them published per se because because they don't carry with them the uh, you know the standard um, documentation and and uh, what the purvey for for where they're found that kind of thing but the point is is that um, he he fully expects them to find soft tissue and he does hear back from them on finding it uh, if I can say something about Armitage uh, I have nothing uh, against the guy but I did read his papers and I'm not so fond of those uh, pieces of science, let's say that. And uh, when I've read some of this work, uh, let's say I found some very obvious uh, problems is in his methodology. So uh, I'm skeptic. Uh, um, around Armitage, but that's my thing. And I uh, I do have some reason behind that, but my problem is, uh, my point was all around uh, archaeology and more very recent things, because we do know uh, a lot about the history uh, of human race. So we uh, do have a lot of uh, history and I cannot see uh, any chance to squeeze uh, that huge amount of data in only 4,000 years old and I do think that uh, radiometric dating and like ice cores are quite re reliable uh, um, yeah, so, uh, my problem is when you talk about dinosaurs, yes, uh, soft tissues can be a problem, but let's say that those are the max limit for uh, organic tissues was, I believe, uh, 700 plus uh, thousand years old. That's still a lot. Uh, and I let's pretend that those samples and i do not believe that they are that recent but let's pretend that they are 700 uh, thousand years old that's still off of uh, a couple of um zeros from your model couple orders of magnitude absolutely yes um, 
or there's of magnitude. Again, you, you and you it, it's not like that. we can find a bone of a T-Rex completely intact. Uh, I've shown you uh, the body of a guy um, buried by a volcano, uh, and it was not a fossil. Do you and know? Do you know why you can't the find a, a... that they are something totally different? from what we can see. Do you know why you can't find a T-Rex bone intact? Yes, I would love to. I mean, do you know why do you know why it's so rare? It's not rare. We cannot find one because you cannot show me any uh, bones of a T-Rex in, in the same uh, condition of that man. And do you know why that is? Yes, I would love to. Okay, so the the reason is is because you're you're comparing apples to oranges. So the T Rexes are typically considered to have um, been the product of a flood catastrophe, and so this kind of goes back to the whole soft tissue thing and thermal degradation and biomaterials. Um, one of the major major flaws in older thinking is that when they're looking when they're they're looking at these what they consider very ancient biomaterials and saying look the degradation rates are actually really really slow because they assign a um, they basically assign a uh, like i said a constant temperature to them here's the problem is that t-rex in that flood when you go out and, and look for dinosaur fossils what you're finding are jumbled bone beds because they first get swept up by the water they drown probably within minutes. They're carried around for a short period of time. They start sinking after death. And then they are carried with currents. They're subject to scavengers. They're, they're subject to warmer water conditions uh, because of volcanism that's coming up from the ocean floors. And by warmer, I, I don't mean, you know, 20, 30, 40 degrees C or anything like that. Just, just warmer than, than standard current ocean temperatures are. Anyway, the point is, they're they're swept in water they're they're exposed to scavengers they go through all this stuff that just shreds them and by the time we find them they've are they're already highly degraded now the otzi man that you mentioned experienced none of that he was a mountain climber after the flood so you can't expect to find t-rex bones in the same condition that otzi was found Yes, but I was not talking about Otzi. I was talking so, uh, about someone buried by a volcano. So uh, talking about what? Was buried very fast and by very hot material. Uh, I, I guess and you have to give us a specific not example. Hot, not even close. It's fine. If you can, I can put up uh, his photos. It's just a skeleton. Okay, gentlemen, and let me it, jump in here. It, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Luke. Yes. Sir. Okay. Yeah, no, no. Fantastic discussion. Very sophisticated. I really, really enjoyed this. Time has flown by. We've done about 45 minutes. Um, so what I'd like to do is get into five-minute concluding statements. That way we can wrap up our thoughts, wrap up our points. If there's anything uh, left hanging that you gentlemen want to address, we can do that in the five-minute final responses. So, uh, Luca, we're going to hand it to you first since you started us off. Uh, you get five minutes, then we'll do five minutes for T-Rock, and then we'll do some audience uh, questions. Luca, go yes. ahead whenever you're ready. I will start to say that I'm no geologist, so this debate is not my specialty. It's not my field. It's not something I'm very knowledgeable of. Why I bring up, uh, bring it up? Uh, so much things uh, about things slightly older than the flood and the creation events because we do have a lot of evidence about that and I want to um, say to people looking at me that I will love to these people to look into the things I brought up Gobeki Tepe, Otzi, uh, all uh, crescent moon cities at all. It's a very fascinating topic. We have so much things uh, about this period, these people, uh, these cultures, and you cannot squeeze them in 
uh, a time frame of 4,400 years. Not at all. Uh, when I said about Otzi, uh, the Copper Age, the Copper Age is a totally different age from the Bronze Age. The Bible starts off basically with the Bronze Age. And it's fascinating uh, to learn about the Bronze Age itself because it was quite a peculiar period. And we do know a lot about it. And my uh, objective for this night is to make people curious and show you that humans and human society is older by at least uh, double uh, the time believed by young earth creations. I think that it's quite um, simple to show how um, humans, human civilization is older than uh, 6,000 years. You can get to 12,000 years very, very easily. And then you have older things, cavemen, uh, you have paintings that are uh, 30,000 years old, and you can go back and back and back and back. And I think that you cannot get to any age <coughs> lower than several millions of years, even if you throw out any uh, dating metals. Even uh, Isaac Newton was not, uh, sorry, uh, Lord Kelvin, not uh, Newton, uh, was convinced uh, by it. He said that the Earth was at least uh, 30 million years old, and he was missing a lot for some reason. So uh, that's my statement, and I hope that people will research these topics uh, because I really care about it. It's a very fascinating topic, and I love people to be curious. Well, thank you, uh, Luca, for that five-minute concluding statement. Also, thank you for doing this. And, uh, gentlemen, you made for a really, really interesting and engaging debate. Uh, T-Rock, we do have your five-minute concluding statement now. So uh, we are going to hand it over to you. The floor is yours whenever you're ready. Okay. So um, basically what I heard mostly was based in circular reasoning. So you've got, you've got um, ice cores. You've got dendrochronology. You've got carbon-14. Those those sorts of things that were discussed quite a bit, and even the uh, soft the uh, uh, biomaterial degradation. Um, the problem is every one of those rates are variable. Every single one of them are variable, including carbon-14. Even though the decay itself is not variable, the the C14 C12 ratio that's used to establish that ratio is variable, and so one of them has to be calibrated against a known standard. And as soon as you quit knowing the standard, your calibration begins to fail. So whenever we hear talk about the Bible starts at the Bronze Age, how do you know how old the Bronze Age is? You're going to have to refer back to either written language, C14 dating, dendrochronology, ice cores. You're going to have to refer to something besides the metallurgy itself um, because nobody's using that as, as a an absolute standard for dating anyway. They're comparing it to one of those others. And so uh, without even contesting whether or not the Bible starts in the so-called Bronze Age, you don't even know when the Bronze Age is without some kind of objective uh, verification for for when that happened. Um, <clears throat> so the other point that, that I heard mentioned, which was not actually elucidated well during the conversation was this idea of convergence where you, you take multiple methods and compare them. Now, I actually did that. I compared um, this idea of limestone deposits being uh, at, at the rate of millimeters per thousand years to lunar recession, and they don't pan out. And so I could do the same thing with um, ancient C14 dating. If you subscribe to C14 dating being valid up to 57,000 years ago, like this, this paper does, I can easily compare that to population explosions of, of animals. And so somebody's going to say, oh, well, 
um, you know, that may, maybe they went through population stasis or whatever, or, or that the, the population growth is tied to um, food resources, that kind of thing. Okay, I, I don't even have to contest those points directly. Um, plants are known to biologically reproduce exponentially faster than animals are. So um, you would be absolutely amazed if you just sit down and thought about it, maybe not, but you would be amazed at how fast plants grow or reproduce and multiply as compared to humans. It's the reason why plants are a food source. If they did not multiply faster than humans, they would not make a good food source because we would eat ourselves literally out of house and home. So that's another uh, proxy that we can use to kind of establish how many, how many years may have possibly passed. Um, but this example of 57,000 max on carbon, let's compare it to uh, growth rate, population growth of rabbits, for example. Rabbits can double their numbers. And I'll be as conservative as you want to be practically. If rabbits double their numbers every 100 years on average, 57,000 years is way, way, way too long for how many rabbits we have alive today and how many rabbit fossils we have in the geological record. Put them together we don't have enough rabbits to, to justify 57,000 years worth of their existence on this earth. It makes absolutely no sense. And you might also note that um, carnivores on the planet, they, they are far less numerous than the vegetarians. So there aren't even enough carnivores to go around to, to keep their population numbers down. So um, with that, I'm going to close. I'm right at the four minute mark. So I'm going to take a minute and say once again, thank you, Luca, for engaging in the discussion. And thank you, Donnie. And, and a really big thank you to the audience for uh, tuning in and, and uh, participating in this. Um, I always do this mainly for the audience sake. So I'm looking forward to the Q&A. So thank you. All right. Thank you, uh, T-Rock, for that five minute concluding statement. Gentlemen, two hours has flown by. Uh, tons of great points that, that both of you discussed in the uh, discussion portion. And again, thank you so much for doing this. we got a great audience with some great questions. And it also looks like there is going to be one of John Maddox's uh, famous after shows. So he says, and I appreciate the support, the super chat, logical, plausible, probable. He says after show is going to happen. Look for link in the chat. So when this debate is over, guys, anybody who's interested in continuing the discussion, uh, please head on over to uh, Logical, Plausible, Probable's channel. Okay, let's get right into some of these questions then, uh, gentlemen. What we usually do on this channel, as you both know, um, we're going to allow uh, responses from the both of you for each question. But whoever the question is for, let's just make sure that they get the uh, timer. Get rid of that. Let's just make sure that they get the final word. Uh, maybe we'll try and keep it to something like two minutes for the first response, two minutes for the follow-up response, one minute for a final word. Okay, so going all the way back at the beginning, we have Lucy MC who sends in a question. I appreciate it, Lucy. I'll get it up on screen. And uh, Lucy has a question for you, Luca. Lucy asks, why is it that evolutionists slash atheists change the age of the earth by billions of years and act like nothing happened or put in, uh, let me see, put in, assume that it may be flawed. I mean, however you want to respond to that. Uh, first of all, it's not a thing that only atheists do. Uh, most of scientists are artists and not atheists. Uh, so, no, uh, most of them are actually theists. If you uh, came here in Italy, most of them are Catholics. For statistics alone, you can get that point. And they change the age of the earth of billion of years when uh, for what i can remember the age uh, is uh, 4.5 billion years ago for quite some for quite some time now so i cannot get why this question thank you luke i appreciate the response to uh, lucy's comments there uh t-rock anything you wanted to add 
Yeah, the the I mean, it's it's kind of a valid observation that that uh, Lou CMC is making. Um, basically, what what she's saying is that back in Darwin's day, they they assumed an, an ancient Earth well beyond the six thousand year biblical timeline, um, and they began assigning ages using various methods. So I don't remember was it uh, Hoyle or somebody like that um, basically worked out an age for the Earth based on uh, some conditions of the sun. He came up with something in the tens of millions of years, I believe. And over time, it, you know, different methodologies, people were playing around with different things until radiometric dating came along. And even when it came along, they started out with different ages that slowly got bigger and bigger and bigger until our present time at 4.55 billion years. And so per Lucas comment, a handful of decades that, that, that may have been in place at the most, um, definitely not the full duration of the study of the age of the earth in the secular realm. But why? Her question is why? Well, I'll tell you why. Because um, why can they do that? Because there is not one single aspect of an ancient earth that can be used to generate modern technology, modern medicine, modern anything. There is nothing in biology that is dictated by evolutionary theory, not a single thing. Um, do things change? Yeah, things change. But um, the principles used in um, in developing medicine, for example, is a favorite of a lot of uh, old earthers. The principles in developing uh, medicine based on evolutionary theory, absolutely nothing that's unique to the evolutionary theory is involved in developing modern medicines. You have to get real time exam, real time results. Now you don't have millions of years. You, you can't wait for things to fundamentally change to something else, um, in order to develop, uh, medicine that's useful for people. So the point is there's no repercussion of being wrong about the age of the earth. There's zero. You can be as wrong as you want to 4.55 is wrong. Somewhere down the line, somebody will decide it's younger or older than that. It won't matter because it doesn't affect um, anything you do to develop modern science in terms of useful technologies. So uh, the answer is why? Why do they do that? Because there's no consequences for it. Thank you for that uh, response there, T-Rock. And Luca, question was for you, so we'll give you the last word. Go ahead. Yes. Um, of course, the age was different back then, but it's stable for quite some time. Back then, they simply do not uh, add the technology to find a good answer. And they went a little bit in the dark, but they were quite good at assumption, if you ask me. And the 10 of millions of years old was from Love the Kelvin, if I remember correctly. It's not like it was wrong, uh, it was lacking some data and it's fine in science. It was a good guess uh, for the data he had. Okay, thank you, Luca, for that final word. And uh, thank you to Lucy for your question. Next question comes in from Sean Mock and this one is for Mr. Rothrock. So here we go. A uh, question from Sean and the question is, how does the polarity reversals recorded in the rocks forming at the Mid-Atlantic Ridge impact the YEC hypothesis? He says, thanks. And Sean, thank you for the question. Go ahead, uh, T-Rock. Oh, you're on mute. Uh, T-Rock. Sorry. Okay. No um, yeah, great question. Um, one, I, I didn't go into, you know, any super specific details like this, but um, the Earth's magnetism is definitely a point of interest because it's one of those limiting factors. And so there's some real interesting stuff that comes out of this very conversation. So he wants to know um, how does the polarity reversals uh impact the YC hypothesis. So basically, I, I want to say it was Dr. Russell Humphreys that basically he he's or, or I'm saying Russell, I, it, it may have been Russell Humphreys in conjunction with somebody like um, uh, either Michael Ward or not Michael Ward, who's the other one, uh, Baumgartner. Um, anyway, those guys put together a, a hypothesis on what they should find in those um, uh, igneous rocks. And so they went and did some investigation. And I, I want to say it was Humphreys that, that basically surmised that uh, we should find clues of rapid reversals specifically. So 
Um, and then they went and pulled some samples and validated their findings and they did find what they expected to find. So that is the epitome of good science. They, they formed a hypothesis uh, before investigating, then they went and performed some experiments and validated their, their experiments. Now, let me, let me say it in terms that I actually personally have, have kind of crunched the numbers on here. Um, the Earth's, the Earth's magnetic field declines at a rate of about 14, uh, it's got a half-life of about 1400 years, um, which is really, really fast compared to millions of years, Earth, let alone uh, billions of years. So it, it kind of goes like this. You can only wind the clock back about 8,000 years um, from today's uh, level before the magnetic field is so strong that it starts inducing um, problems for the biota on the Earth, 8,000 short years. If you go back 20,000 years, you literally have a magnetic field 20,000 times stronger. Now, how do we know the decay is exponential in i.e. a half-life curve like that? Well, it's because it's the standard physics used in electronics that you use to develop things like smartphones and TVs. So it is absolutely not a linear decay curve because electrical properties are not linear. Um, they are exponential like that. So now take that 8,000 year number. I just do the simple math, 3 billion years divided by 8,000 that you have to have this perfect cycle where, where the magnetic field stays exactly at levels conducive to life flourishing on earth. It cannot get too low. It's another clock. If it, if they get too low, you have problems with bombarding uh, radiation from the sun. If they get too high, you have problems locally with the energy field being too high uh, at 20,000 times the current strength. You rip the iron out of, out of uh, every living thing and kill it instantly. Um, so anyway, do the math. 3 billion divided by 8,000. You have to have a minimum of 375,000 reversals in the ocean floor to validate an old earth. And so that's kind of the, the point of the whole thing. Um, you don't have that many. Thank you, uh, T-Rock, for a, a thorough answer on a very good question. Uh, Luca, we'll hand it over to you if you had uh, yes. a response. Uh, the reversals are quite interesting. Uh, I did not talk about those uh, for obvious reasons. I do not know nearly enough to discuss the topic on a professional level, but... I do know that uh, those reversals are documented into the um, geological uh, record, but not only in, you know, in that, even in uh, archaeological records, are uh, we do find uh, evidence for that. Uh, I remember that we do find uh, a different um, orientation of the magnetic pole in pottery and we can date some pottery with that method pottery uh, goes back quite a lot uh, there are some uh, civilization that span to 12,000 years ago um, I of course uh, we are talking about the crescent moon but uh, also um, Japan. Japan has a very old civilization up there. It's very interesting if someone wants to read about that. Luca, I appreciate your response. And uh, T-Rock, question was for you. So we'll hand it over to you for a final word. Okay, so um, one of the points here, uh, one of the main points here, we, we heard a lot about compressing all of these events into a short timeline and reversals is, is a really good topic to bring up on that because um, the, the actual science shows that the reversals actually happen very quickly. So there's nothing to compress. I was trying to compress these long events into a short timeline, but there's nothing to compress because the natural cycles um, are already so short that they fit quite comfortably into a 6,000 year time frame. And um, beyond that, one of the things about reversals that you have to know is it's kind of like, it, it's it's very demonstrable in, in a standard iron magnet. If you take an iron magnet and you drop it on the ground and disrupt its magnetic field, what happens is you weaken it. Now you can get it back up again. You can, you can come up with methods to increase the strength, um, but over time, especially in natural circumstances outside of a laboratory, um, the field, it just continually weakens. 
And so a reversal can flip it, pick the, the total energy back up for a short period of time. But then what happens is you've actually effectively shortened the original sustainable timeline. So flipping is kind of bad. It absorbs energy. It absorbs a lot of heat energy and it accelerates the demise of the, um, of the magnetic field in general. So uh, um, I guess two points there that I really want to highlight is reversals for a long old earth or long age old earth are very bad because all they do is sap the energy, the net energy out of the system faster and reversals in general happen very quickly anyway and there's nothing to compress in a uh, young earth timeline. <clears throat> T-Rock, thank you for the final word there. And the next question I've got here to the audience. Great questions. I appreciate it. And the next question is a question from one of our channel members, Jamie Russell. I appreciate the question. And he asks, uh, I believe this is for you, Luca, but not specified. So he asks, how do you explain the existence of the geologic column when erosion should have taken out any record many times over? If it's for me, uh, it's quite simple. Erosion, it's not a process that happens everywhere. You get uh, places where the erosion is uh, chipping up uh, mountains or things like that and other portion where those materials are uh, deposited uh, and so you have uh, building up of material so it's not like you will have uh, barren earth so quickly also mountains and things like that are growing because uh, earth movement is uh, building up material like Everest is growing by the some centimeters every year I think so, yes, that's the explanation. Thank you, uh, Luca. And over to you, T-Rock. So that, that sounds sounds good um, to just say it like that, but that's actually a testable hypothesis and, and probably not one that most evolutionists actually want to do. You can, you can set up a, a, a small-scale lab event where you simulate uh, mountain building events with wind and rain erosion. And um, I think what you're going to find unequivocally, what you're going to find is that um, if you match your simulated mountain growth experience to what we actually see today, um, the wind and the water are going to erode much faster than the mountain can build, much faster. There's, it's not even close. And, and so um, it, that's also highlighted by the point I've already brought up about lunar recession. You're winding the clock back and erosion just accelerates rapidly um, in conjunction with the moon being closer to the earth than it already is. Today's rates are too fast for even mountain building episodes. Another big flaw in um, evolutionary thinking is that mountain building episodes that we see today are more or less constant through time. Um, in application, in, in engineering application, that cannot possibly be true. There, there may be some little discussion you could have about this, but, but essentially the overwhelming idea is that uh, when, when a continental plate collides with something, it's just like a car crash. On impact, you have X amount of energy, but the energy actually follows an exponential decay, just like everything else in the world. It's, it's an exponential decay. And so probably what you're actually seeing right now is the residual deceleration of continental plate movement not a constant over time. So um, that scientific analysis, so to speak, that was given completely misses the mark of application physics. Hey, Rock, I appreciate the response. And uh, Luca, question was for you, so go ahead. Uh, feel free to have okay, a Okay, uh, Everest is growing. It's a fact, we can measure it today, so. Uh, it's fact that a uh, mountain can grow. Uh, it's not uh, a linear process, of course. Uh, over time, some mountains will be leveled out over a very long time, and some will grow uh, in another part of the earth. 
eventually uh, this process will stop, but we are talking about something very, very uh, away. It's like billions of years uh, from now. Okay, gentlemen, thank you again for the responses to that good question from Jamie Russell. Okay, so here we got a question from Sean Mock. This is a question for the both of you. Um, so we've had a good mix of uh, questions for T-Rock, questions for Luca, and now here's one where we can get uh, both of your input. And we can always start with T-Rock because Luca started with the last question. So he asks, question for both. When was the ice age and how do you know this? So I guess, uh, you know, your respective views of, of the ice age, given your positions tonight, Luca, old earth, uh, T-Rock, young earth. Go ahead, T-Rock. Okay. So this is a really good question. Um, ice age has to have a very significant cause. And that cause is in the biblical um, rendering of, of Earth's history. That is, the cause is initially the flood. So what you need for an ice age is you need um, very warm oceans that produce a lot of evaporation. The evaporation produces a lot of rain. And then um, it also produces a lot of cloud cover, which uh, kind of, kind of um, produces a cooling effect because the sunlight does not hit the land. Now, now, I mean, in, and I, I talk about application physics all the time as, as an individual, no matter what you do as a, as a career choice, you know, intuitively that when you stand out on a hot summer day in the open sun, it's hot. And then as soon as a cloud passes overhead and shades you, the temperature drops quickly. And so that's kind of what you get with an ice age. Um, look at the ring of fire. Look at the great big giant scar. Luca brought up or somebody brought up the mid-Atlantic ridge. Um, that's a great big opening up and, and a release of heat from the ocean floor that warms the oceans. The water goes up in the form of evaporation. You get cloud cover. The sun is no longer contributing as much heat to the earth, to the land surface anymore. And so what you end up with is um, cooler summers because of the cloud cover and, the, and so on and warmer winters because of the still hot ocean. And so the cycle compete, uh, repeats for a long, long time and you end up building um, uh, what, what happens is your, your, um, your snow cover and your ice and stuff like that don't melt 100% back during the summer. They'll melt back quite a ways, but not all the way. So the next year you build a little more, the next year you build a little more. After a hundred years of that, you've built up a substantial amount of ice. Um, the secular explanation is bizarrely inadequate. They induce, um, you know, these, uh, it's the Milankovic theory of the ice ages, whatever. Um, basically it has to do with the orbital cycle of the earth. Um, there's not even enough energy in that to warm the oceans. To the point where you can get that effect so um the bible does the bible say anything directly about the ice age no um probably the best you could do um it's actually more thorough than you might think but go to the book of job and he literally mentions 14 different phases of water every one of which exists on the earth today and every one of which is absolutely necessary so it looks like job must have lived probably not very long after the ice age T-Rock, thank you for the response. Sean, thanks for the uh, solid question and important question. And uh, Luca, we're going to hand it over to you for uh, for your answer. Yes. Uh, what uh, kind of ice age? Because they were a lot of ice ages during secular timeline. So the answer are quite few. So uh, we still are in a, a ice age tomorrow. Um, so yeah, uh, if you think about the ice age, we are all thinking about it. it's the the one, the last one uh, during for the last uh, thirty five million of years, and basically uh, the ice age. Uh, when we uh, think about uh, an ice age, we are talking about a period inside an ice age during by, uh, from uh, 2.5 million years ago to uh, 
11,000 uh, years old, more or less, uh, 30,000 uh, years old. So, yeah, the, uh, the Ice Age you are asking about, I think, that stopped uh, anywhere between 11 and 30,000 years old. Okay, perfect. Um, there was a question for the both of you, so I guess we'll just kind of move on here and uh, get a question in here that comes from Pickled Grammar. And let me get this up on screen. Gentlemen, the question is, how many times does one have to test the item to get the number you want in radiocarbon dating? And I do believe that this one is more so directed at you, Luca in light of some of the comments I was seeing from Pickled Grammar. So why don't we go with that assumption and, and start with you, Luca? Mm, any sample is dated times and times over. And if you get uh, odd results, and when you look uh, at the graph, you will know when something is wrong. The sample is simply... Uh, throw out you will have to assume uh, some sort of contamination so uh, quite a lot of times uh, but all those times you need to get a custom result if you do not you will have to assume some sort of contamination of the sample Luca, I appreciate it. And over to you, uh, T-Rock, for your response. Well, I mean, Luca just kind of <laughs> kind of uh, tacitly admitted what we've been saying all along. The dating methods don't objectively work on their own. You have to test them and compare them against multiple things. Apparently, according to Luca's comment just now, you do get wrong answers quite frequently, and you just have to keep going until you get the one that's right. Well, how do you know which one was right? Well, it's because it's the one that you agree with at the end of the day. That's all it is. It's the one you agree with. So, um, you know, it, it also kind of alludes to this idea that um, you send samples to a professional dating lab and you got to retest over and over and over. Why? Because the professional dating lab isn't competent enough to do it right the first time. I mean, what's, what's the issue? Why do you have to test it so many times? Um, bottom line is it's just indicative of how people pick and choose the dates they want. So what I would highly recommend, although I will admit I have not actually checked it out, I've read some reviews about it, stuff like that. Um, uh, it looks like a resource definitely worth pursuing if you're interested in answering these types of questions right here. There is a, a book called The Dating Game. And it is, has nothing at all to do with the romance section, but if you go to uh, cre uh, creation.com, CMI's website, and uh, just search the dating game, you can probably find a link to their in their store to, to purchase that. I would highly recommend that because it, it really does expose the shuffling that goes on in the background to try and get dates to uh, basically tell you what you want them to tell you. T-Rock, thank you so much. And a question was for you, Luca, if you wanted a quick final. Yes, response. I want to clarify one thing. You do the test over and over. You give the sample to different people, different labs to remove bias. If different people with different bias, uh, different backgrounds, uh, whatever, they all came out with the same results, you can be pretty sure that's a good result. It's not like we test again and, and again because we want uh, specific results. Uh, it's the opposite. We send that sample to different people in different places because we want uh, a result that's without bias. That's the most important thing in science, remove bias. I everyone as one we need to remove that how we do it we le let uh, do the experiment to different people with different backgrounds with different anything and if we have a, a consistent uh, consistent result 
we do know that we have something on our end. Okay, thank you for that final word, Luca. And looks like we're coming down to the last couple questions. Uh, again, to the audience, I appreciate the questions and I appreciate the responses from T Rock and Luca. Uh, some very thorough answers to many technical and very important questions. So, this has been a very fantastic debate on everybody's favorite debate topic the age of the earth. So, uh, next one comes in from Wesley Coleman. And his question is for you, Luca. So he asks, what are your thoughts on Dr. Andrew Snelling's recent work on the tapetes where they showed no metamorphosed or cracked sandstone in the bends? Example, bent before cooled. Uh, have you heard of that, Luca? And do you have any thoughts on it? And then just yes, make sure you I do. Uh, and for what I know, they were some cracking in it, but I'm not familiar enough with the work of Snelling to say it was wrong. Uh, I think that when you uh, critic someone, you need to be more informed than that to say something. So I did hear that some cracks were indeed present, but I do know it for sure. No, because I did not uh, review his uh, work uh, myself. So I did hear that, but I do not want to accuse uh, someone, maybe unjustly. So that's my two pennies. Okay, thank you, Luca, for the response to Wesley's question. Over to you, T Rock, for your. So, uh, this is another great question for application physics, and in in my field, like I say, I'm kind of in the manufacturing. Um, metaphor metamorphose cracked sandstone in in the rocks before they cooled. Probably the correct word there is hardened, not necessarily cooled in in the igneous sense. But either way, uh, the point is taken. So. Um, the bottom line is there are no cracks that you would expect to find those those rocks were absolutely formed during uh, during a period when they were soft so they they serve as another one of those proxies for time where you can tell that um particularly the hardening event must have happened very quick and the bending happened before the hardening and so soft soft rocks bend very quickly and easily but um but what you're really seeing is is uh, kind of the order of operations there the bending first then the hardening but but one way we can know this in real time is um i talked about aluminum and carbon steel a while ago uh, metals are notoriously ductile um i mean to varying degrees but almost always more so than sandstone uh, particularly hardened sandstone so in 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 metals now we use a um, a common construction uh, aluminum is called 6061 T6. The T6 represents a, a particular hardening phase of or, uh, process of, of that metal. And so the idea here is if you take a sheet of 6061 T6 aluminum and you try and bend it to a 90 degree, now wh what you're going to find is the radius of the bend absolutely matters. And the radius um, that you can get away with is also going to be somewhat tied to the thickness. And, um, and so in aluminum, in, in aluminum that's used for construction, when you go to bend that, it cracks all on its own and it's a metal. And the only way to get around it is to take a torch to it and heat up the seam that you want to bend, heat it up really good, then bend it slowly and then let it cool in that position. Yeah, and, and a lot of times you have to hold it in that position until it finishes cooling. Um, but anyway, the point is, is that that um, in order to get sandstone to bend like that, even heat probably wouldn't work. And, it, and if it did, it would take a huge amount um, and, and it would absolutely be obvious in the in the metamorphic um, uh, characteristics of the rock if that had happened. Now, some will argue that you put it under a lot of pressure and then bend it slowly, you can do that. And that sounds great theoretically, but it's 
not something you you can practically do on that scale. If you try and do it on a smaller scale, I'm pretty sure you're just going to break the sandstone. But either way, the problem with that line of thought is, is that there is a top layer that is not under the same pressure as the bottom layer. And the top layer, you can see the stratification in the bins. And the top layer has the exact same physical characteristics as the bottom layer. And it wasn't under all that pressure um, because it's the top layer with no overburden on it. So... Uh, yeah, another uh, proxy for time that demonstrates that this deep time is not passed for these things to happen. And there's nothing to compress in a 6,000 year time frame. G Rock, thank you so much for that response to a really good question from Wesley Coleman. And uh, it was originally directed at you, Lucas. So you get the um, you get the final word there. Go ahead. Yes, uh, I simply do not know. Uh... For what I know, uh, cracks were found, but it's all I know. Uh, I do not think that uh, something like that proves a young, young Earth, because it's bizarre. Um, if you have all those layers so soft, uh, first of all, they were hot enough to be playable, Okay, so we will have some problem with the temperature and the flood. It's a very important topic I want to discuss with McQueen. And other than that, uh, geology is really, really a <laughs> topic where I do not know anything. My only point against Nelling is I've heard that cracks were indeed present, but more than that, I do not know. Well, I appreciate the final word there, Luca, and we come down to our final question of the night. Two and a half hours really does fly by. Again, guys, great job with tonight's debate. This one comes in from Cool Jesus. And uh, Cool Jesus has a question for you, T-Rock. Looks like it's on the dinosaur soft tissue argument that uh, you guys discussed in the discussion portion. So he asks, granting that dinos do have soft tissue, it is mineralized. How come no pterosaur or dinosaur fossils have bone in them like the mammoth fossils that we find? Okay, so this is not an uncommon question, I guess. He says it is mineralized. Again, we uh, tried to try to clarify that earlier. It's got a, a casing on some of the actual elastic tissue. Um, it is not, the tissue itself is not the mineral that you get from permineralization. It's got a shell on it that has to be removed. And what's what's inside that shell is absolutely soft tissue that that has still has original elasticity in it. But he says, how come no pterosaur or dinosaur fossils have bones in them like the mammoth fossils? I actually kind of answered this earlier, uh, kind of comparing T-Rex bones to um, to Oxy. Uh, the reason is, is because the animals, the, particularly the dinosaurs uh, that you find, have gone through the, the wash and rinse cycle horrendously and are terribly degraded before they're even buried. By the time they're buried and, and, and encased in, in uh, sandstone or whatever it is, they've already been highly degraded. Mammoth fossils are post-flood. They did not go through a, uh, you know, a drowning, scavenging, um, warm water decomposition kind of scenario at all. They're found in ice. They look more like they got trapped in a, in a uh, snow blizzard. So they wouldn't possibly have the same physical degradation characteristics as pterosaurs or any of the other dinosaurs. <clears throat> Appreciate it, T-Rock and Cool Jesus. Thank you for the solid question. Uh, Luca, over to you for your response. Yes. Uh, so that's pretty interesting because we do not see ever uh, non-avian dinosaur with intact bone and when T-Rock says that it was because of the flood we do have uh, some extreme events taking place uh, over some people some thousand of 
years old, like Pompeii, and I've shown to you that the skeleton is fine. It's not the only one, uh, so it does not match up with me. Uh, so yeah, uh, also uh, they are really degraded. Uh, not always. We it's very hard to find uh, a connected fossil, of course, but we do have samples of very well preserved uh, dinosaurs even uh, samples with uh, imprints of feathers uh, or even with um, fossilized uh, interiors uh, and we do know what those dinosaurs were eating uh, because of these findings one of them was in italy uh, one of the few dinosaurs find uh, found in italy and he had some uh, inner parts fossilized and we do know what was eaten uh, because of it so yeah it was not so bad that flood it seemed and uh t-rock you get the final word question was for you go ahead so interesting that he compared uh, flood uh, flood sediment deposits and uh, ice age deposits to Pompeii where they are buried in hot ash and scorched um, completely different uh, preservation methods are going to give you different results but even if you go find a complete dinosaur fossil um, they're still found in flood deposits so the preservation mechanism is very different than mammoths um, I mean you're, you're talking night and day uh, ice preservation versus um, sediments and water. So even in the even in the conventional timeline, with dinosaurs living 65 plus million years ago, um, they still recognize that every single dinosaur bone they find, they find it in waterborne sediments, not ice. Okay. Well, thank you for that final word there t rock again gentlemen very sophisticated debate tons of fun i love this topic the, the the audience loves this topic and you guys did not disappoint to the audience thank you so much for so many awesome questions this has really been a fantastic audience question and answer sometimes the best part of the debate and another thing too is this debate was very comprehensive you guys touched on a number of very important topics and so please to the audience, share this debate around as uh, as these kinds of debates are, are important. And on Standing for Truth, we, we strongly believe in critical thinking, which is why we host so many of these debates. We've actually hosted now over 170 debates on all sorts of topics. So if you are a debate addict like, uh, like myself and I guess many of the viewers here, uh, you will have uh, debates to enjoy till uh, probably the rapture. So again, Luca and T-Rock, thank you so much for doing this. Let's have some final thoughts and final words. Uh, why don't we start with you, Luca? Again, thanks so much. Uh, and uh, some final thoughts. Yes, uh, it was a good debate. I think I did not so well, <laughs> but I tried my best. Um, I hope that the people here enjoyed it, and I did try to get some interesting facts inside it. Uh, so I did put some effort inside it, and it was fun. Luca, thank you so much. We always appreciate you, uh, you know, engaging in these topics here on this platform. And of course, you are always welcome for these types of important debates. So uh, T-Rock, again, thank you so much for doing this as well. Uh, you've been here many times as well. And so again, thanks for doing this. Some final thoughts, final words? Yeah, uh, same sentiment here. I really enjoyed the discussion and uh, the, the, th the points that... Um, Mr. Luca brought out. Um, I, I hope, always hope whenever we do this that I, I make my point that um, as young earth creationists, we are very practical in our application of um, science, physics, and, uh, you know, the natural forces. Um, personally, and I know a lot of uh, young earth creationists share this sentiment, but personally, um, 
I try really hard not to invoke miracles unless the Bible specifically warrants us to do so. And I think that was borne out tonight by tonight's conversation. I, I just basically try and say, hey, this is this is what the real world we live in does. And this is um, the results we see in nature and the two are compatible. And so um, absolutely refuting the idea that uh, young earth creationists have to de de deny science because we don't. We apply science very well, actually. So, um, yeah, very fun debate. Um, good conversation. Thank you, Luca. Thank you, Donnie. And thank you to the audience. And uh, look forward to doing this again sometime very soon. Absolutely. My pleasure. My privilege. If it weren't for you, uh, awesome debaters giving us your time for these debates. We wouldn't have any debates to enjoy. So we've had a great audience. Uh, happy Resurrection Day. I hope everybody is having a good holiday weekend, a long weekend. And it looks like the fun continues over on LPP's channel. He says, uh, don't miss the after show. It's where the cool kids go for dumpster fires. Uh, logical, plausible, probable, definitely uh, holds the record for probably the most after shows, but the most after shows to remember. So I'm going to let uh, these hardworking uh, debaters uh, go for the night. Again, very scientific discussion. I'm going to stick around for about two minutes and just kind of go over some reminders in terms of the upcoming events that we have. So again, thank you so much, uh, Luca and T-Rock. And I am going to let you gentlemen out. Job well done. And there we go, guys. Another debate in the books. And uh, one of my favorite topics, of course, age of the earth. We want to host more of these important debates. And uh, like I said earlier, we've done now about 170 debates on all sorts of topics, theology, philosophy, morality, soteriology, uh, age of the earth, of course, creation, evolution, ancestry, uh, you name it. And of course, as uh, everybody should know by now, uh, Stand for Truth Ministries, we have a, an open debate challenge for 2022 when it comes to evolution. We've now uh, hosted roughly 20 to 25 of these uh, evolution debate uh, challenge debates, I guess you could say. So um, we've got a ton more coming up as well. I'm pumped. I'm excited. I'm thrilled. And if, if you want to get involved in this debate challenge, uh, no matter who you are, we're interested in uh, having you participate. Of course, we keep these uh, debates civil and professional, and <coughs> these important topics need to be need to be discussed because critical thinking is important. So, I do want to uh, mention that the fun does continue uh, April nineteenth. So, you guys are not going to want to miss out on this debate. Uh, I've been uh, going back and forth with uh, several evolutionists, several seasoned uh, evolutionists when it comes to debates, and uh, we agreed that it would be a good idea to engage in some formal debates on very specific topics rather than a, a general debate on, let's say, evolution or age of the earth. We are going to start incorporating some of these really hyper-specific uh, topics to debate. So that is why me and uh, Taylor from the Snake Was Right YouTube channel, we are going to be debating endogenous retroviruses. So uh, I promise you this will be a debate to remember. I'm pumped. This is on the uh, this is on the 19th. And then uh, next week, of course, the Evolution Debate Challenge continues with Kent Hoven and Wade the Wizard. And then we're going to change it up on the 22nd. So the 21st is Wade the Wizard and Dr. Kent Hoven, Evolution on Trial. <clears throat> and then on the 22nd, Matt Slick will be back here and he'll be debating uh, Otis Lewis, who's uh, debated here before as well. Two very, um, very good debaters. And uh, this will be one to remember. I'm pumped. The Great Trinity Debate, Matt Slick and Otis Lewis. So again, that is on the 22nd. Then on the 27th and 28th, we've got our uh, very important two-day event, the uh, Slaying Heresy two-day event. We're going to have uh, speakers and Christian apologist Kelly Powers for day one. Uh, countering the cults. We're going to be dealing with uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, their doctrine, false prophecies, uh, the history of the uh, J-dubs, <laughs> I think as some people call them. And uh, that's going to be a very uh, thorough show. Uh, 
And of course, as always here on Standing for Truth, we keep these uh, events, conferences, interviews, presentations, we keep them interactive. We do them live. So make sure you are here with your uh, questions, objections, counter arguments, because we are going to do our best to make it as thorough as possible. Then uh, the very next day, the 28th, we've got um, Christian apologist Anthony Rogers. Uh, he's... He's been around for a while doing some fantastic debates. He's had a, a ton of great debates with some big names on the topic of the Trinity and oneness and the nature of God. So day two will be uh, myself and Anthony Rogers defending the Trinity and debunking oneness. We're going to be, uh, again, making this one interactive. So uh, regardless of what your view is, uh, make sure you're here live and uh, make sure you're tagging me with your questions, criticisms, objections, so on and so forth, and we will do our best to answer them. We want it to be comprehensive. Uh, T-Rock's going to be back here uh, debating Mark Drysdale. This is going to be on May 2nd. This is going to be a, a guaranteed to be epic debate. Uh, two seasoned debaters. Drysdale's done a ton of debates. T-Rock, as you know, has done a ton of debates. Uh, they're both technical. They're both uh, well-studied. And uh, the Genesis flood debate, another very important topic. So that one is going to be on May the 2nd. The big one uh, in terms of soteriology, we've got uh, Robert Wilkin and Robert Sungenis. They are going to be debating uh, soteriology is uh, salvation by faith alone or faith plus works with a uh, strong focus in terms of the debate thesis on Romans 2.13. So that is going to be on June 9th and time flies by guys. So this debate is going to be here before we know it. And so make sure you're subscribed. Make sure you hit that notification bell because I promise you, you do not want to miss this debate. Uh, Wilkin and Sungenis are two powerhouses in the world of soteriology. Both have written and have uh, spoken extensively on this topic. So please make sure you are here for that one. Speaking of soteriology, we got another soteriology related debate on May 7th. Free grace versus lordship. What is true biblical salvation? Pastor J.D. Martin and Reverend John Crawford. Again, two well-studied, well-educated individuals, uh, especially when it comes to the topic of soteriology. So make sure you are here for that one. And if you have not yet seen our uh, Flood Boundaries conference from uh, a week or two ago, this one was comprehensive, roughly uh, five hours. And uh, we heavily interacted with the audience and some audience questions and objections and things like that. So if you have not yet seen that one, please do check it out. People seem to really enjoy the Dr. Jerry Bergman show that we did as well a couple of weeks ago on human evolution. And therefore we've got him back uh, for next month. I believe it is May 14th. And uh, he'll be giving a presentation on Neanderthals. Are Neanderthals evidence for evolution or biblical creation. So again, that's just a snapshot, a snapshot, I should say, of all the events and, and shows that we have planned for you in the future. Uh, Luca Medugno, we're going to be having him back on soon. We're working on setting up a debate between him and Professor David McQueen. Um, so we're working on some, some solid debates, guys. So just make sure that you are keeping yourselves up to debate, uh, up to date on all the upcoming uh, shows. And again, thank you so much for tuning in. Logical, plausible, probable. He's got an after show that should be kicking off very shortly. So again, thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you again to the debaters, Luca and T-Rock. I really appreciate your time. And I appreciate you guys making this for a very memorable and I would say engaging debate. So that being said, uh, God bless everybody. Enjoy the weekend and standing for truth is out.